Scala. Look like a martyr to marauders like Tartar. Wise out slaughter, whack MCs order a plotter. Original woman, decipher the womb. Crown of creation, fruit of the planet, earth and the moon. Welcome to another episode of Wise the Dome. Today is a uh, uh, we have a very very special guest. Um, I'm honored to have him on. Um, he's an Africana Studies professor at the University of Houston, an author of over 40 books, um, a great intellectual, and somebody that we value within our community and we hold close to our heart. So, Dr. Gerald Horn, thank you for giving us the time and thank you for coming through. Thank you for inviting me. Indeed, indeed. I'm a big fan. So uh, I just want to tell the fans first, this is Dr. Gerald Horn's latest book. Make sure you get this. Uh, the Counter-Revolution of 1836, Texas Slavery and Jim Crow and the Roots of U.S. Fascism. The way Dr. Horn talks about slavery in the United States, in my opinion, is like no other because he's able to connect dots that a lot of scholars are afraid to make for possibly political reasons, or they just don't have the capabilities to research the way Dr. Horn does. But once you read this book, you'll want to go in and dive into the rest of his collection um, and, and, you know, go from there. But I want you guys to make sure you guys get this book, especially all of my fellow Texans who are from Texas. It will explain a lot. Um, and so we'll go from there, but thank you. So, First question I wanted to ask you, Dr. Horn, critical race theory, um, mm -hmm. taught in public schools, you know, I, well, uh, critical race theory being taught in public schools was a, a big deal within the last election cycle, even though critical race theory was not actually taught in elementary and middle school. Um, but considering that there aren't many nuanced discussions about race in public schools in the first place. Where did this attack on CRT come from? What prompted it and what do you think about it? Well, I think what prompted it is obvious. Uh, mm -hmm. Periodically, the right wing in this country, which to state the obvious is disproportionately comprised of Euro-Americans across class lines, they gin up these issues to motivate their base motivate their base to come to the polls, motivate their base to support the Republican Party, which is their primary, although not exclusive, political contraption. And those who follow these issues recall that before critical race theory, there was something called political correctness. Right, right. That simultaneous with the rise of so-called critical race theory, was the rise of so-called cancel culture. Right, right. All of these are similar and all serve a similar purpose. Now, with regard to critical race theory, it actually developed in law schools. And right. having a law background myself, I recall when it was being devised in law schools and uh, it was being devised for law students for them to try to understand how and why it was that this vaunted U.S. Constitution, which we are taught to be uh, a kind of peerless document, uh, somehow allowed for <laughs> the per per perpetuation of slavery, the perpetuation of Jim Crow, U.S. apartheid, uh, lynching, and all the rest. And so what's happening now is that the right wing is filling their oats in light of the election from in 2016 until 2020 of Donald J. Trump, the 45th U.S. president. Uh, they were able to make uh, many advances, not least uh, establishing a majority on the U.S. Supreme Court that bids fair to reverse many of the gains that came during the 1960s. And so, this idea of critical race theory, once again, to reiterate, is devised to motivate their base to come to the polls in neighboring Virginia. Mm -hmm. You may recall that it was not so long ago that Glenn Youngkin, right. a creature of Wall Street, was able to put on a fleece vest and somehow engage in a metamorphosis that turned him into a regular guy. 
<laughs> he was one of the major uh, propagandists and demagogues uh, flagging and flogging this issue of so-called critical race theory. Uh, he even drug into the conversation the novels of Toni Morrison, the late Nobel laureate, a black woman novelist, uh, he was suggesting that little Johnny and little Jennifer were getting depressed and alienated and bursting into tears when they had to read uh, Toni Morrison's work. And this was supposedly an emblem of critical race theory. Uh, this was nonsense, but it propelled him into the state house in Richmond and is now preparing the ground for his to make for him to make a race to become the U.S. president in 2024. So. Um, Wow. This is what that controversy was all about, and uh, I'm afraid to say that it has gained traction. Yes, indeed, indeed. And what does it say about the base, though, right, that they, <laughs> when critical race theory became something that was controversial within, you know, these 24-hour news cycles that a lot of these Republicans watch and Democrats, um, to be honest, um, that it was able to galvanize them to the point where I've seen different documentaries and read different articles about, um, let's take uh, South Lake, for instance, in Texas, you know, um, they were galvanized to the point where they banned, uh, you know, books that aren't even controversial, you know, like books about Wilma Rudolph and Martin Luther <laughs> King, right? Well, what does it say about their base that they are so easily, easily um, galvanized to remove any idea of young Black students in these public schools learning their history, even when the history is not controversial? Mm -hmm. Well, in order to answer your question, I have to do a, a detour into history. Mm -hmm. uh, that is to say that rather graciously and generously, you held up my book about Texas, wherein I talk about what I refer to as settler colonialism, mm -hmm. which also, I'm afraid to say, afflicted North Carolina. Uh, indeed, in my book on the 16th century, I point out that when the English settlers crossed the Atlantic in the 1580s, their first attempted colony was in what they call North Carolina. Wow, right. And what's interesting is that this, these settlers were united across class lines. By that meaning, some were poor, some were wealthy, some were middle class, but they had a similar goal. The similar goal being to take the land from the indigenous population. For example, you still have a Lumbee population yes. in eastern North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And to then uh, stock that land with enslaved Africans, such as yourself, myself, our ancestors. And that was the recipe that led to the creation of the United States of America. Mm -hmm. But what happens is that the world changes and the United States had to adapt. In my work, I've pointed to the Haitian Revolution, 1791 to 1804, uh, in the Caribbean, a revolt of enslaved Africans, which turned the tables on the whole system of slavery, igniting a general crisis of the entire slave system, which can only be resolved with its collapse, which it begins to do in the U.S. South in the 1860s. And then in the 20th century, you have the rise of African independence movement, Caribbean independence movements, their delegates coming to the United States and being treated like they're Black Americans, which means they're treated in a hostile fashion. The United States wants to win them over, particularly in the ideological contests with the socialist camp led by the Soviet Union. And so therefore that creates conditions for the retreat of Jim Crow, mm. U.S. apartheid. Mm -hmm. But now the Soviet Union collapsed 30 years ago. The United States and those who comprise the Euro-American majority across class lines that supported uh, the genocide against Native Americans and the enslavement of the Africans feel they do not need to make as many concessions uh, to 
international public opinion, and voila, uh, therefore you have the rise of this demagogy, uh, such as beating the drums about critical race theory, which is not taught in kindergarten through 12th grade in any case. Right. This is part of this uh, rather diabolical scheme hmm. to turn back the clock, perhaps to the bad old days of Jim Crow, and if some have their wishes granted, perhaps even back to slavery itself. Right. Uh, sadly and unfortunately, I'm not really sure if many of our leaders and intellectuals are familiar with either A, how we got to this point, or B, uh, what could befall us if we're not careful. Indeed, that's, that's a powerful sentiment. And also, I think it's one that oftentimes we don't want to face as a people because of obviously the <clears throat> the history of and the pain that comes with our enslavement and the Jim Crow era and what happened after Reconstruction, but our allegiance to certain political parties within America a lot of times acts as blinders where we don't want to see the harsh truth. And I think you hit the nail on the head and, and that, was, that was definitely a very powerful sentiment. Um, I saw an interview that you did on the legacy of W.E.B. Du Bois on the Real News Network. And, uh, you know, Du Bois's talented 10th idea is considered controversial by many in today's time, especially within the Black academic and quote-unquote conscious community. Um, from, the, from that ideology, Du Bois, you know, became a Pan-African uh, socialist. Uh, and, and if I'm not mistaken, he... Um, when in his 90s, joined the Communist Party. Um, what do you contribute to his evolution in thought? Well, first of all, W.E.B. Du Bois, born in 1868, passing away in Ghana, West Africa, 1963. A, the first Black person to receive a doctorate from Harvard University in the 1890s, studied at the University of Berlin in the 1890s, where he was exposed to what was then the most sophisticated socialist movement founder of the NAACP and its leading uh, organizer from about 1909-1910 to his departure in 1934-1935, uh, returning to Atlanta, where he taught at Atlanta University and HBCU, and also uh, penned what may have been his most significant book, uh, Speaking of Black Reconstruction, which retold the story of the post-Civil War era uh, in the United States of America, uh, laying down a narrative that is yet to be exceeded. I think what's important about Du Bois, and it's sadly not necessarily the norm nowadays, is that he continued to grow and develop. He continued to evolve. You mentioned the talented tenth. That was uh, an idea from the early stages of his intellectual career where he thought that intellectuals like himself uh, and all others from the middle strata would be a kind of vanguard leading the Black American population uh, out of misery. But as time passed, he tended to revise, if not jump, uh, that particular idea. Uh, as you suggest, uh, he joined the Communist Party in his 90s and left the United States to go live in West Africa, where he is buried. Uh, to this very day. So one of the lessons I think we should take away from the lengthy and glorious career of Wen Du Bois is to continue to try to grow and evolve and develop. That's something I really don't necessarily see. I mean, by the way, this gray hair is not a dye job. <laughs> it, it's something that is quite natural. It bespeaks the fact that I've been on this planet for quite a while. And one of the things I've noticed amongst my peers is that some of their last new idea was maybe a half century ago, mm. which is a shame and a sin. Right. They haven't developed. They haven't evolved. They haven't grown. And, uh, and to turn the lens on myself, for example, perhaps in my most controversial book, 
is the counter-revolution of 1776, yeah. slave resistance and the origins of the United States of America. Mm -hmm. That book came out about, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago. Now, to be self-critical, if I were to write that book today, I would integrate more Native American history, which you mm -hmm. find uh, in profusion in my book on Texas, for example. Mm -hmm. You find a Native American history uh, in profusion in my book on the 16th century, for example. And I, I see that as a product of my trying to grow and develop uh, and to uh, try to, to pay attention to what's going on and to then incorporate those insights into my work. That's something I'm afraid to say we do not see enough of in our community. I agree. And I guess that leads me to my next question. As far, especially with Black academics who are in the business or say they are in the business of liberation, why does class analysis always seem to be missing from mainstream Black academia when we're talking about the issues with capitalism, imperialism of the global South and all of these different things? We talk, we will talk about racism and white supremacy in the context of America and the Caribbean till we turn blue in the face. But when we start talking about how, you know, Europe and America through colonialism, neocolonialism, imperialism, and capitalism have helped to destroy the planet, that conversation seems to always be missing. Why do you think that is? Well, we just talked about W.E.B. Du Bois, who tried mm -hmm. to do that. Mm -hmm. At the age of 83, circa 1950, 1951, he was handcuffed and indicted fed on federal charges for supposedly being an agent of Moscow because he was in favor of banning nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. You only have to beat one, plant, one slave to keep the entire plantation in line. Mm -hmm. And during that period, that glum and grim period, the 1950s, you had many intellectuals and academics who were treated very harshly, like Du Bois. And people today instinctively have imbibed that lesson. And that's very unfortunate because if you look at slavery, slavery, which many of our ancestors traversed, was an exemplar of a class relationship. I right. mean, Slaves are basically unpaid workers. Right. And this leads me to my next point, which is that we're living in a country where the right wing has hegemony, where, as noted, you have a unity across class lines amongst many Euro-Americans. Look at Mississippi, for example, where the Euro-American community across class lines votes nine to one for the Republican Party. And so that's the dominant ethos and the ruling uh, ideas or the ruling ethos of any society or is the ethos and ideas of the ruling class. And we are laboring and suffering under the domination of this ruling class, which penalizes those who try to do a class analysis. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a simple reason uh, why uh, you raise this question of why black more black Americans do not engage class analysis, or for that matter, do not engage the concept of imperialism. Uh, even though people are supposed to be into Africa, uh, they don't necessarily uh, look to uh, African intellectuals for inspiration who do use class analysis. Some of them might be familiar with Kwame Nkrumah, for example, but uh, apparently have not read his work. Right. Uh, apparently are not familiar with how, I'm afraid to say, when he was overthrown as leader of Ghana, West Africa, in 1966, February, that the U.S. ambassador at that historic moment was Franklin Williams, a former leader of the NAACP. Wow. And part of the problem with the U.S. and the Black community today is that the NAACP in the late 1940s decided to cut a deal with the devil, mm -hmm. figuratively speaking. Mm -hmm. Recall that Du Bois had returned to this organization he had helped to found in 1944 in a very progressive political moment. 
and was tasked with the idea of being a kind of minister of foreign affairs for the NAACP, which was going to become much more involved in the international community. But then what happens is that when World War II ends with the victory over fascism, the United States was an alliance with the Soviet Union. The United States turns on this wartime, wartime ally, speaking of the Soviet Union, leading to the Red Scare and the Cold War, leading to the NAACP firing Du Bois in 1948 because he would not break with his radicalism, with his pro-socialist ideas, and the NAACP leadership moved away from those ideas and in fact embarked upon a purge, a purge, an ouster of those on the left within their ranks. And that purge and the after effects of it, uh, it has continued to this very day and to the point where the NAACP hardly pays any attention to what's right. going on in the world. Right. I don't understand how they feel they can make progress in the United States where the right wing is so hegemonic and so dominant, where the Supreme Court has been captured by the right wing after the NAACP invested heavily in a strategy of having lawyers symbolized by the late Third Good Marshal uh, file these lawsuits, which were supposed to be the vindicator and the guarantor of our rights. But obviously that strategy uh, is no longer viable. Right. <laughs> we need a new strategy. But uh, it seems like they're incapable of devising said new strategy. Do you think that part of it is the fact that we have been indoctrinated to the point where instead of fighting um, imperialism, we would rather try to benefit from it? Oh, sure. And I understand <laughs> that quite well. Although uh, I, I never could imagine how many people could be bought for a mere $50,000 a year. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Not to mention how many can be bought for $100,000 a year or $200,000 a year. Because, you know, in the United States is relatively a wealthy nation. Mm -hmm. uh, as of today, by certain measures, it has the largest economy. But alas, what happened was that their obsession, that is to say the U.S. obsession with the Soviet Union, led the United States to cut a deal with China on an anti-Soviet basis about a half century ago. And in return, China received massive direct foreign investment from U.S. corporations. Uh, today, of course, uh, Microsoft, Apple, Tesla, uh, KFC, Starbucks, they're all heavily invested in China. But it was not envisioned that then China would then come to challenge the United States of America. And by some measures, it already has surpassed the United States in terms of having the most sizable economy, mm -hmm. which is quite a challenge uh, to the United States of America. It's unclear how the United States will respond because part of the bargain as well was that the People's Bank in China bought treasury bills from the U.S. government that's basically loaning the United States government money to keep everything from the Pentagon to the post office afloat. The total is about a trillion dollars. You just had the election of Speaker McCarthy, the Republican leader in the House of Representatives in Washington, D.C. There is already loose talk about the United States reneging on its debt. Mm. That is to say, mm. not necessarily paying back mm -hmm. This money mm -hmm. or, or or the bargain deciding to cut Social Security, which is a su substantial part right. of the U.S. budget, mm -hmm. which is a subsidy to people over at the age of 65. You have many people in Durham, North Carolina, who live on a Social Security check. Yes. Social Security is thrown out the window. You're going to have people eating dog food for breakfast. Mm. So this is the point where we're at. It's obviously a perilous times, desperate times. But it's not clear to me that our intellectuals and organizations are either A, aware of the perilous moment, or B, have any idea of what to do about it. Wow. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I feel like it just makes me feel, you know, that a lot of this is a conscious effort. Um, if you can't beat them, join them type of thing, right? And, you know, who cares about imperialism as long as I'm able to live on a house on a hill and 
<laughs> and have and drive a drive a nice German car and all of those things, right? And mm -hmm. um, I've even seen movements within the so-called Black conscious community where we are trying to identify as American to the point where we want to disassociate ourselves from the rest of the diaspora and the continent, which to me is just working backwards. But I uh, do want to ask you this, unless you know you're in black leftist circles, uh, we often hear we often don't hear we don't hear much about uh, black leftists like Paul Robeson, Claudia Jones, Walter Rodney, and others. Um, can you talk to us about some of the history of the black left and when the leftist ideology began to grow amongst black people in America? Well, first of all, with regard to leftist ideology, there are many ways to define it. Mm. Uh, that is to say, anti-slavery ideology in the context of the 19th century uh, could be seen as leftist ideology. Mm. In Cincinnati, in August 1829, when white mobs attacked the Black community and the Black community engaged in armed self-defense, uh, that was an expression of leftist ideology. When many of them uh, fled across the border into Canada, and became allies of Canada against the United States of America. Uh, that was an expression of leftist ideology. But the, the term is usually associated with the 20th century and the rise of the socialist movement. You mentioned Paul Robeson, born in central New Jersey, 1898, passing away in Philadelphia, 1976, the tallest tree in our forest, star athlete, star singer, star actor, lawyer. Uh, he was associated with movements of the left, which led to his going into exile, living outside the United States for most of the 1920s and 1930s, returning to the United States in the 1940s, but like Du Bois falling victim to the Red Scare and the Cold War already defined a few moments ago. Uh, his income falls from the six figures to the low four figures. You see that his passport is taken in the United States to not want him to go abroad and blow the whistle on U.S. imperialism and Jim Crow and white supremacy. Yet he still uh, remains popular uh, globally. Uh, in my book on Southern Africa, White Supremacy Confronted, I point out that Nelson Mandela in the 1950s considered Paul Robeson to be one of his uh, major heroes, wow. uh, for example. So that sort of socialist orientation, socialism basically means a redistribution of the wealth, this time from top to bottom. Most redistributions of the wealth in this country happen from bottom to top with these so-called tax cuts. Uh, that is to say, uh, tax cuts for the wealthy and tax increases for the rest of us. Uh, that's the norm in the United States of America. And socialist ideo ideology tries to do something different. Uh, but alas, that ideology, as noted, began to retreat. In the 1950s, with the Red Scare, people saw what happened to Robeson, what happened to Du Bois. People saw what happened to Claudia Jones. Uh, she was born in Trinidad, migrates to the United States in an early age, becomes a leader of the U.S. Communist Party, but then uh, deported. And she goes to London, where she becomes a leader of the growing uh, Black British community in the 1950s, starting the West Indian Gazette which was then the leading newspaper amongst Black British. Uh, you mentioned Walter Rodney, who I'm happy to say uh, I happen to know. In, mm. in fact, wow. uh, Walter Rodney, born in Guyana, on the northern coast of South America, the only English-speaking country, predominantly English-speaking country in South America, former British colony, a man of African descent. You may be familiar with his book, uh, Europe Underdeveloped Africa, uh, yeah. for example. And the reason I knew Rodney was that when I was doing law, uh, I was dispatched to Georgetown, Guyana to become to be an observer when he was placed on trial by the government. Uh, the trial seemed to be going well uh, for Mr. Rodney. This is in 1979, 1980. And it led to a devious plot to murder him, which happened in June 1980. Mm. But his work uh, continues to be influential, continues to influence uh, many across the globe. 
And I can think of no more significant legacy than that. Awesome. And um, just to give you some more flowers, I kind of feel in a certain way that you are similar to Walter Rodney in a sense that in the book Grounding with My Brothers, um, he talks about being a scholar and a professor, I, I believe, at the University of the West Indies. And he would go to the neighborhoods and ground or talk or build with the people that were there, the community, to see what their vibe was, to see what they were going through. And now in 2023, obviously, you know, we can kind of do that um, through Zoom. But um, I, I'm just a brother that wants to see my people free, a brother that loves to read um, about our history, about our struggles, about our triumphs. And I kind of, can kind of relate what Walter Rodney was saying with what you are doing now. So I just wanted to tell you that. But um, um, you also have an amazing book called um, Black Jacobins. Um, mm. The U.S. Haitian Revolution and the Origins of the Domin Dominican Republic. Um, can you tell us the connection between the Haitian Revolution and slavery in the United States? You know, we're often taught that the Haitian Revolution was an isolated incident. We're also taught that slavery itself, slavery in America is isolated from slavery in Europe, you know, but we are all familiar, those that study with the, you know, the triangular aspect of what was going on here. But that was, that, that's an economic thing. But there are a lot of entities right now that are doing everything that they can to act as if our liberation struggles are not related. And so when I think about slavery and we think about 1804 and the importance of the Haitian Revolution, it being taught, because I, you know, I have Black Jacobins and I also have the one that was written by CLR James, right? But we're often taught um, that it is an isolated incident. You know, I remember being in school and learning these different things about slavery and it was taught as if it was, you know, this happened here and this was going on here. There's no way for, uh, you know, uh, Africans to know what was going on over there, this and that. But we know that we have correspondence. I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but what Thomas Jefferson writing, writing letters talking about, you know, what's going on over here is, yo, like, we got to fix that, like, because that can come over here, right? And so... And you're like, if you can just explain to us the connection between the Haitian Revolution, um, obviously uh, the Louisiana Purchase, and the fear that the Haitian Revolution may have brought to uh, the owners of enslaved Africans in America. Well, the Haitian Revolution, 1791 to 1804, was one of the most significant events in world history, certainly one of the most significant events in the history of people of African descent, because as noted a few moments ago, it ignited a general crisis in the slave system. Uh, to that point, as you know, many Europeans had been uh, feasting upon the free labor of Africans. With the Haitian Revolution, that was the beginning of the end for that system of cruel exploitation. In the book that I wrote, that you reference, I begin the book in August 1791, September of 1791, with the first US president, George Washington, becoming apprised of the unrest in Haiti. And he writes worried letters. And he had reason to, as a slaveholder to be worried mm -hmm. because a few years later in his own Virginia, you have Gabriel's revolt, which was revolt in Richmond, where the Africans say that they were inspired by the Haitian Revolution. And in fact, uh, after Haiti achieves independence in 1804, it not only inspires revolts such as the largest and bloodiest uh, slave revolt in the United States, speaking of what happened 
on the so-called German coast outside of New Orleans, Louisiana in 1811, uh, where you had uh, slave owners who had fled from the Caribbean because of fear of the Haitian Revolution, then moved to New Orleans where they thought they would be safe with their property so-called uh, in tow, and yet inspired by the Haitian Revolution, uh, the property re rebels and uh, is on the verge of toppling uh, that particular odious regime. Uh, you mentioned the so-called Louisiana Purchase because France had been the major colonizing power uh, in what becomes Haiti, and they suffered a grievous loss with the Haitian Revolution and decided to liquidate what they considered to be their territory. Uh, speaking of the territory that now incorporates a, a good deal of the United States from the Canadian border heading south to New Orleans, that's the Louisiana Purchase, so-called, uh, which was directly instigated by the Haitian Revolution. And I should mention the major footnote that, of course, that land did not belong to the French in the first instance. Mm. It belonged to the indigenous population, right. which the U.S. authorities then began to liquidate murder systematically and then invite over Europeans of various economic backgrounds uh, to occupy that land, which, of course, many still do. Mm -hmm. And we also know that after the success of the Haitian Revolution, the victorious government, like revolutionaries anywhere and everywhere, they want to spread their gospel. They begin to uh, instigate the slave revolts uh, throughout the Americas, you know, for example. That's talked about in my book, that people want detail and documentation. And this leads to an attempt by the U.S. authorities to crush the Haitian Revolution, just like the U.S. authorities in the 20th century have sought to crush the Cuban Revolution. Mm -hmm. Of course, I wrote a book on Cuba as well, and my book on Southern Africa talks about how in the mid-1970s, in my lifetime at least, you saw the socialist government of Cuba send soldiers, many of whom are of African origin, back to Southern Africa to defeat the apartheid army on the battlefield, right. setting the stage for the liberation of Angola, of Namibia, of Zimbabwe, of South Africa, and indeed the Southern Cone. So there are parallels between the Haitian Revolution and the Cuban Revolution, which is one of the reasons why both countries have been treated so horribly and detestably by the U.S. authorities because they feel that they send a dangerous message to the rest of us. And sad to say, uh, many of our people, many people in our community are blithely and blissfully unaware of what has led to their being liberated thus far from an odious kind of Jim Crow that if we're not careful, can return with a vengeance. Yeah. I, I totally agree. And as far as that, that last sentiment, um, we don't have to spend a lot of time on it, but I do want to ask you, like staying in Haiti, you know, after Haiti won, after uh, Haiti won its independence from their enslavers, um, you know, they were forced to pay, you know, France reparations, or at least the I don't, I don't know. I, I'm not for sure. Was it France or the or the or the former slave owners that? Well, that's coterminous. Most of the yeah. former slave owners uh, were French. Mm -hmm. And what happens is that the money is transferred to the government, which then disperses it to the former slave owners and their. Their descendants. Yeah, indeed. And so yeah, you said it. Uh, you pretty much said it in your last statement, but you do think the reason why Haiti gets ravished by outside entities to this day is because of the fact that Haiti being a symbol of Africans winning their independence over Europeans, Haiti can never flourish and become a country that is uh, has its you know full autonomy and able to prosper and and show the rest of the world an example what a black nation could be. Um, do you think that 
the reason we are seeing what's done to Haiti dates all the way back to the Haitian Revolution? Well, sure. I mean, Haiti, <laughs> the imperialists uh, and their precursors and their predecessors, they have long memories. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, uh, many of our community, they do not have uh, long memories. And they recall all too well the fact not only that the Haitians uh, took uh, a large fortune away from the slave owning class, uh, oftentimes in, in my classes, when I teach, you know, you're teaching class and many of the students, they're fiddling with their smartphones as mm -hmm. you're lecturing. And so you come and grab their smartphone and, say, and I say, I've just taken your property away from you. Mm -hmm. That's what happened with slavery being abolished. Mm -hmm. Billions of dollars in property in the 19th century, and of course, who is to say that might be trillions of dollars in today's terms mm -hmm. are snatched from slave owning families, not least in your backyard in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And they are enraged and infuriated. That leads to the origins of the Ku Klux Klan and racist terrorism. It leads to Jim Crow, which is a kind of internal exile for the black population remaining in places like Durham, North Carolina. And a lot of that is, is ascribed rightfully uh, to the Haitian Revolution. Mm, <laughs> right. People do not forget that sort of thing. And so Haiti continues to be punished and pulverized to this very day uh, because of that. And sadly and unfortunately, our community has not been able to mobilize sufficiently and organize sufficiently to keep that from taking place. Indeed, and a caveat for the listeners is in Durham, North Carolina, which was once known as Black Wall Street, there is a neighborhood called Haiti, and mm -hmm. Haiti was created um, by Black people, and it was named because they were inspired by the Haitian Revolution. Um, with that said, um, Juneteenth, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. Um, being from Texas, you know, I well half North Carolina, Texas, but living living in Texas for such a long time, obviously. Um, when I first got there, like Juneteenth, what is that, right? And because, uh, you know, Black people would be you know, barbecuing and, and just having get-togethers and things and, and, and being able to commune with each other. And it being a national holiday now, um, there's a book, I think, uh, and I like, I, and the reason I show some of these books is just, just for the readers, but I'm pretty sure you're familiar, familiar with it. It's a small little book about Juneteenth um, that was written by, I forgot the sister's name. Annette Gordon-Reed. Yes, yeah, you got it. Right, and um, and so it's a good book if anybody uh, wants to, oh yeah, here it goes. Um, yes, Annette Gordon-Reed. Um, but anyway, um, <clears throat> Juneteenth being a national holiday, a lot of times when things become national, it loses, it loses the real meaning behind it. Um, but what I wanted to know, and because I was watching an interview one day from you, and it was, <clears throat> and obviously reading this book, um, you know, we always wondered about the thought that enslaved Africans in Texas didn't know about the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, I've heard you say that this was false. Can you speak on like slavery in Texas and the real reason why enslaved Africans continue to be enslaved after the Emancipation Proclamation? Well, as you suggest, this is a subject dealt in some detail in my book that you mm -hmm. held up a, a moment or two ago. But to put it uh, summarily, June 19th, 1865 is now marked as Juneteenth, a holiday by the federal government. Supposedly, what happens is that when the Union troops arrive in Galveston, Texas, due south from Houston, they came to apprise the enslaved that didn't you know that you were free? Well, that's a lot of poppycock. <laughs> Number one, 
the Emancipation Proclamation signed by Abraham Lincoln to go into effect January 1st, 1863, did not necessarily apply in Texas. Texas was part of the Confederate States of America. It was an open rebellion. It's as if the U.S. Congress uh, passed a law tomorrow saying that slavery in Mauritania, West Africa, was abolished with well, the United States government does not have jurisdiction in Mauritania. Yeah, right. So the U.S. government under Lincoln, effectively, it was not in control of Texas. So it wasn't an idea that the people didn't know they were free. And what happens when the Union troops arrive, June 19th, 1865, recall that the Confederate states had surrendered, Confederate states being the states in the South, led by Virginia, including Texas, that tried to overthrow the United States government so that they can enslave Africans forevermore. When the Lincoln army arrives in Galveston, they're basically coming, not necessarily to apprise the Africans that they were free, but it was for more complex reasons. Those complex reasons being that even though the Confederate states had surrendered in April, they were continuing to fight. In fact, they were migrating into Mexico in order to establish a rear base. If you look at your map, you'll see that Texas has a long border with Mexico. Mm -hmm. And you may know that Texas was formerly part of Mexico right. before the Anglo-American settlers revolted in 1836 and set up an independent uh, republic. What happens is that tech Mexico at that particular moment was under the rule of a French occupying force. That French occupying force was in alignment, in alliance with the slave owners in Texas. The slave owners in Texas were going to then migrate into Mexico under French rule to continue the war. The U.S. troops show up in Galveston, uh, not necessarily to tell the Negroes that they were free, but basically to set up a military force that would prevent that plot of slave owners continuing slavery under French rule in Mexico. Mm -hmm. A significant percentage of these troops who show up in Galveston were actually black troops, and they in conjunction with progressive Mexicans proceed to crush the French occupiers in Mexico and to prevent Mexico from reestablishing slavery, which had been abolished decades earlier under a president of African descent, speaking of Vicente Guerrero. So that's the story actually of what was happening in Texas and in Mexico in June, 1865, and not necessarily the fantasy <laughs> that many of us are taught yes. uh, with regard to the Negroes not, actually not knowing that they were free, right. uh, which was just yet another insult uh, to our ancestors. Yes, and, indeed. And and that's a that's a thing. I In seventh grade, I took Texas history and that's what was that's what was taught. Um, you know, we didn't we didn't know we were free as if there wasn't as if we didn't have uh, ways to find out information about our, our own lives and what was going on in the world. And you brought up Vicente Guerrero, who was a black man and former president of uh, Mexico. We also know that Maroon Society started by, you know, people like Gaspar Yanga, also formed in Mexico. Um, during the height of slavery in Texas and the Deep South, what was Mexico's stance on the enslavement of Africans? Well, part of the reason that there was so much conflict between Mexico and Texas was that, as noted, Mexico had moved to abolish slavery in 1829. That outraged the settlers, led by Sam Houston, who bequeathed in an ostentatious fashion his name to the city that I'm now sitting in, Houston, Texas. Stephen F. Austin, who gave his name ostentatiously to the capital, Austin, Texas. And so they felt that slavery would be abolished in Texas because Texas was then part of Mexico. 
So they seceded mm. to set up an independent nation. And then following their secession in 1836, you saw many enslaved Africans fleeing into Mexico so that they could be free. Thousands and thousands of enslaved Africans fleeing from Texas into Mexico, which is a major financial loss for the slave owning class. In retaliation, you see in 1846 that Texas, uh, which had joined the United States in 1845, uh, encourages the United States to attack Mexico, which it does, wages a war of aggression, seizes California, now the richest and most populous state in the United States of America, uh, by some measures, the fifth largest economy on planet Earth, some say the fourth largest. Mm. That's the rich prize that was pried away uh, from Mexico uh, during a war of aggression. And one of the reasons why Texas secedes once again, this time from the United States in 1861, and joins the Confederate States of America, because they felt that the United States government was not sufficiently aggressive in pressuring Mexico to return enslaved Africans who had fled into Mexico. Wow. They thought that the Confederate States of America would be much more aggressive in doing so. And so they left the United States and joined the Confederate States. But alas, what happens is that, as noted, the Confederate States were defeated. Slavery was abolished in 1865, which then leads to the Jim Crow regime uh, following from 1865 up to the 1950s. And then at the international climate, as noted a few moments ago, leads to a retreat and erosion of that system of apartheid, just like the international climate ultimately helps to explain why the U.S. Civil War took place and slavery was abolished in 1865. Yeah, that's, see, and that's why, like I'm going to tell the, the people again, that's why this book is so important, um, especially those who were indoctrinated in the Texas public school system about what, quote unquote, Texas history was is in regard to slavery and its um, dealings and foreign policy with Mexico. It's not what you think and it's not what we were taught. And um, Dr. Horn does a great job of explaining this. Um, and so I definitely suggest all you guys go get the book. Um, and um, the first book I read of yours was The Counter-Revolution of 1776. Um, I think this work is extremely important. Um, like, can you talk about the issue of slavery, slave resistance, and the Revolutionary War of 1776? And also how, like, there was, uh, you know, over 20,000 Black people or uh, Black loyalists that fought for the British in the Revolutionary War. We never hear about that. We never talk, we talk about Crispus Attucks and all of this, but we never hear <laughs> about anything else, right? That more black people fought for, I guess the promise of freedom than they, you know, I get, fought for their slave masters, um, their slave masters freedom. But anyway, um, can you speak on um, just that whole concept and that idea of how slavery and the Revolutionary War, how it's all connected? Well, I draw a parallel between the 1836 conflict that led to the secession of Texas from Mexico because Mexico had moved to abolish slavery in 1776. British, Br the British, the colonial power, were taking steps towards abolition of slavery in England itself. And there was a fear that that decision would leapfrog the Atlantic. Not only that, but London had declared in 1763, 1764, that they were tired of waging war against Native Americans and then turning the land over to real estate speculators like George Washington, a lineal ancestor of the real estate speculator who was just in the White House up until January 2020. And the question of the revolt of British rule in 1776 that led to the formation of the United States of America was driven by land and labor, mm. which is the crux 
and the material force of most revolutionary struggles, land and labor. And what happens, of course, as you correctly suggest, is that our ancestors had the good sense not to engage in class collaboration. Mm. Class collaboration, of course, is the specialty, I'm afraid to say, of the Euro-American settlers who, as noted, unite across class lines, the poor uniting with the middle class and the rich uh, in a block to seize land from the indigenous and enslaved Africans. Uh, our ancestors were into class struggle right. against George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, Patrick Henry, and the other uh, slave owners. Mm -hmm. And what happens is they fought a war and lost. Mm -hmm. Some of them did gain their freedom, as you suggest. They gained it either in Canada. Uh, many of their descendants wind up in Nova Scotia, uh, due northeast from Boston. I've been to Nova Scotia. I've done research there. Uh, or some of them wind up in London. Some of them wind up in Sierra Leone, mm -hmm. for example, sure. in West Africa, mm -hmm. which is in some ways is an analog uh, to Liberia. Right. Which, started about 200 years ago. So this is the actual story. And what's interesting is that right now, believe it or not, to show you how confused and confusing the United States is right now, uh, you have a number of Euro-American leftists who are attacking me in, in very vitriolic and venomous terms because of what I just said. Mm. Even though supposedly they subscribe to class struggle. I just said the class struggle was at the heart of this crisis that led to the secession. They do not necessarily see the Africans in class terms for whatever reason, I don't know why. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe they're blinded by white supremacy. Uh, I would have to have That's them talk to, to a psychiatrist or a social <laughs> scientist to uh, get the real reason for that. But in any case, uh, they have no explanation for why and how it is. As noted in Mississippi and in other states in Dixie, you have Euro-Americans to this very day voting nine to one for the Republican Party. Right. Uh, except to say that they're confused. But I, I think there's another explanation, which is they would like to turn back the clock because the country was built upon class collaboration. The so-called American dream was based upon European settlers coming to this country poor and becoming wealthy mm. from the free labor of Africans and stealing land from the indigenous population. Right. So this is part of the problem uh, in this country. Uh, they have had no explanation for January 6, 2021. Mm. And once again, you have a class collaboration which sought to have an attempted coup d'etat to prevent the peaceful transfer of power and believe it or not, uh, this may happen again uh, as elections loom. So, didn't that's something similar really just happen in Brazil? Brazil? Sorry, didn't something similar just happen? Well, in January eighth in Brazil, you had a replay. Except, what's different about Brazil is that January sixth, the power had not been transferred; it was in the process of being transferred. Mm -hmm. Mr. Trump was going to unleash a mob to prevent that from happening. A gallows was constructed on the grounds of Congress, the Capitol Hill. Perhaps they would have uh, carried through with their idea of hanging Mike Pence mm -hmm. to use the slogan aimed at the vice president. Whereas in Brazil, power had been transferred already to Lula, the left-leaning president. Right. He was 400 miles away, mm -hmm. expecting flood damage. Mm -hmm when these mobsters invade the Capitol. So they were emulating, in a sense, January 6th, but in a sense, uh, they were not as devious as those in Washington, D.C. And speaking of which, I, I see that it's a little after an hour, so I'm probably going to have to sign off, but I appreciate your giving me the time to speak with you and your audience. And please, be sure to send me the link to our discussion. Most definitely, I will. And Dr. Horn, thank you again. We definitely appreciate all the work, dedication that you have given to us in our community. I salute you and thank you again for the time. You have a great night. Thank you. Good luck. I'm going to sign off. Indeed. You have a great night.
You too. Bye-bye.